not being able to see everyone, so if you can't see me, kind of find me. I'll try not to paint. That's my that's my main thing. Um, so I am Lisa Bjorkman. I think all of you know me from River Clyde. I've been here over a year now, but no longer a baby. I've moved into the toddler stage, which is great. It's been a great year. I'm super thrilled to have taken over for Ron. And we're just going to go over the budget for the 24-25 school year. Um, what you have to do with these things is super interesting. I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. I might take my shell. Oh, there's a series of that. Hold on. That, that one. This is why accountants are, are just, control for you. Let me just see that real quick. Um, so, as a part of the general um, general fund, is mostly what we're going to be talking about tonight. Am I going to go? That's why he's the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. So I went ahead and we we decided on projecting the enrollment at a flat enrollment for the year. Um, we were one of the kind of luckier. Um, we'll see a slide later. Uh, districts that had a relatively small dip during COVID, and now we've come back up a little bit higher than where we were before COVID. So our projected enrollment is at 1503.7. Now that is full-time equivalent. So that accounts for yeah, part-time students and full-time students. And we know every kid counts. That's not our head count. That's what we get paid by the KK club. Um, so revenues were increased based on our state funding. Um, the F203 is our state funding report that I usually do sometime in April, which I did this year, to see what increases we were going to receive. And then also projected levy collection from our past senior levy that will start for the 25 year. So this levy year, we will get um, a smaller portion than the next year because we will get the end of 2024 and the beginning of 2025 for our collection. And then expenditures were increased on known negotiations. Um, I think it's gonna get to in a minute, or maybe I'm, uh, but it's known negotiations and increases. We had a 10% increase to utilities that we know about, 40% increase to um, our insurance again this year. So that was really unfortunate. We had um, increases to food costs, transportation costs, and then our our software providers, most of the smaller bills are coming in between three and 4%, kind of like IPC for the state. Uh, but the insurance has seen two record projection years of increases, and we're hoping that this is the last one. Those are all factored into our budget. Um, so this is just a line item of, of the budget. So this is, um, if you were to look at the budget, this is page seven of our F, um, sort of F195. And this is our projected enrollment. So that's where I get the enrollment numbers from. We go through every school and we see what their projected enrollment will be. And then we kind of say, how are the kindergartners looking? Is it gonna come in under or over? And then we come to a final number, and that is what we came to for this uh, next school year. Um, so the summary of the general fund budget is on page eight. I know I attached the document to the board, and it is also on our website if you want to go do some light reading and you don't want me to explain it line by line. Um, you can find it on our website. Uh, and page eight through ten of the ones of, of pages one through nine. Pages um, is where the general fund budget is, and that's mostly where most of our money goes to. This is going to be a high level overview of that general fund. So, the key elements are revenues. So, this is our projected revenue for 24 25, it comes in at 27,181,565. And you can see that is an increase of just under a million dollars for the school year. That's partially from our increase in the levy that we're going to receive that first part of 2025, and partially from an increase in funding that the state provided through the legislature. Um, there, this is our expenditures, and these are broken down by different um, objects of expenditure. So the top line is our regular instruction. So you can see that the regular instruction, and these are from eight to 10, so just in case eight to 10, is twelve million one hundred sixty three thousand, and then on and on down to special education, vocational education, and then compensatory education is anything like Title One, 
or any other Title II, Title IV, any other programs like that. We have a community services, and then our 9,000 is our support services. That's the overhead, um, maintenance, custodial, anything that we it takes to run the building. We are projecting, and um, we are projecting a $209,000 loss for the year, and that is what we think is reasonable and feasible based on the negotiations. And we knew uh, we've been planning to um, slowly whittle down a little bit of fund balance, but we do have a pretty healthy fund balance. And, um, and so we're trying not to cut unnecessarily. So page four of 159, there's three important values. So I kind of did it different. You can go through so you don't the colors. Um, the first is the total revenues and other financing services. That one's in green. The second is total appropriations, which is what they call the expenditures. And the third is our ending fund balance. By Washington state law, our ending fund balance for the board of directors, the most important thing for um, your goals is that it must be uh, positive. If it's not positive, you go into what's known as uh, binding conditions, which a lot of districts, some districts have a similar thing to that law. But we're in good shape. So this was set out by General Fund, Associated Student Body, Debt Service, Capital Projects, and Transportation Vehicle. So our, re our revenues are in green, our expenditures are in red. Um, you'll notice the resolution that you're signing tonight, hopefully, to approve it, is the appropriations for the district. So that's the ones in red. And then ending fund balance is what we're going to end the year on in each um, fund. Debt service and transportation vehicles should be noted. Um, transportation vehicle funds, we don't have one. We are contracted out for transportation, so that goes through our general fund. And debt service is solely an in and out. We just have a, a small non voted bond out of that, so there's no ending fund balance there for a reason. This is the graph of our enrollment. So, so you can see. Um, if you looked in the 1920, I think it would have been slightly higher than that, almost 1,400. Um, but since COVID, we've really increased quite a bit in our enrollment, and I think we will see a, a leveling out of that, of that increase. So we projected at a really relatively stable enrollment. This is just an overview of where our revenues come from. So you'll notice that over 56% of our revenues come from state. Uh, that would be our apportionment. Um, our local taxes, that's our levy. It's about 11% levy and any other taxes that we would receive. And then we have 7% in special purpose, 22% in other state revenue. And then this is where we spend money. So uh, it's important to note that we spend, you know, 45% of it on regular instruction, you know, very small amount on federal special purpose. That's the winding down of our ESSA funds. Uh, they're gone next year, but we really don't think we're going to spend hardly anything unless we get a grant. And then we spend about 11% in central education. That's where a, a boost of the funding came from this year. They boosted the rate for special education, so we're getting a little more money there. And then the other ones in the smaller portion. Um, these, this is our S-185F, so it's a four-year projected um, budget that we have to present to the board, and Ron and I have the same philosophies on presenting this, we're relatively flat. It's really hard to tell, and I think every accountant in the state of Washington got super nervous when COVID happened because nobody made their budget. It was all wrong. <laughs> like, we went over, we went under, we went, and so um, I think it's really conservative and a good idea to just project flat unless we hear that there are new housing developments or new industries coming to town. Um, and we have kind of heard on that. So those are the next four years of projected enrollment. And then these are our routine ASD fundraisers. Usually this report goes to as part of the ASD budget, which is done at the high school by the student body. Um, and that has not changed. It's exactly the same as it was last year. And then these are our other funds. So the capital service fund, our capital levy, um, expires in December 31st of 2024, so that will be um, off of the revenue side of things. And our current technology project, should we not run another capital levy, 
Will we finish the 2024 Springside School Year? And other maintenance projects were finished this year because um, we just had, uh, this year was the last year of most of the maintenance stuff that had to do with the, um, the capital project. The debt service fund, which we used just as a funding mechanism, we got a $1.28 million bond that we funded. We made sure we had enough cash to pay for the RMS modernization. That will be paid off in December of 24. So that will come off our books as well. These are reference pages, and there's a link in there to um, the OSCI's apportionment if you ever want to take a look at it. And just some information on how I, where I gather the information from, and how I put it all together. And that's really it. I attached in your guys' copy and the long email that I sent you. There was both the full version of the 195 and the full version of the 195F. But for the public, that's on our website already. Did anyone have any specific questions? With your with your projection, what what does that leave us as far as the year? So it will we'll end at I think it was three point six. And that is projected from it's kind of complicated. Um, it's three point two six nine. So that is, and let me tell you how that can change throughout the next month because we're ending a school year before I built the budget for the next school year. So my thought process is we're going to end about 3.4, 3.5 this year. If we end slightly higher, that fund balance will end slightly higher than the budget for next year. So, yeah. so those are projections based on right now, and um, it's a pretty conservative projection. I imagine we'll end higher than that. Um, one, one, just could you clarify a little bit, Lisa? The, the bond is a little confusing for people because you know we advertise running a bond, we yeah. failed passing our bond, yeah. but the bond that we got for the middle school is different yeah. than the other bond that we ran and did not pass. Yes, yeah. so there's two types of bonds we can run. We can run what's called a non voted bond, which is not voted by the public. That's what we currently have on the books, and we owe. Just over 400,000 on it um, at, that's due in December. And that non voted bond, we are restricted to how much we can borrow without the will of the people, the vote of the people. So it's a very small amount that we can borrow. And we, and we borrowed the amount that we could as a funding mechanism. That is an option to do if we had a traumatic situation like a boiler breakdown. I don't even know if we have boilers. <laughs> we have some sort of HVAC system that can break down. Um, but <laughs> I think we don't think anyone has them anymore. But an HVAC system goes bad. We could actually ask the district. You guys could say, "Hey, Lisa, can we need to run a non-voted bond to get it at 1.3 million?" And we could do that without the vote of the people um, and pay it back as we got the, the money in. We would have to find revenue stream. <laughs> so what we did. Remember, is when we passed the capital levy, we decided to get a, the loan, yeah. the bond. Right. So we could complete the project in the very beginning yep. and pay it off with early dollars so the city would pay the right. yep. So we didn't and have then, to wait until we got all the money and then it started. Yeah, because the three year levy helps us pay. So we, we use the bond as the funding mechanism to then, when the three year levy gets, comes in or finishes, then we pay the bond payout. Yeah. So that was yep. how we that yep. was how we funded that. The voted bonds are the bonds that really can build buildings because you can't really get enough money to do a lot of projects with a non-voted bond. It's pretty restricted. But with the voted bond, that's the one where we could get 20, 30, 50, and I think we went for 70 for a while. Yeah. So, Lisa, so what we need to do now is vote to approve it. Um, actually, there's a resolution yep, in your packet, yep. and that you'll do that as part of the board. I just um, we just have to probably close the meeting fairly soon, the hearing, sorry, and then we can open the regular board meeting. May I bring up just one, uh, I think, transparent topic that I find comes up in community, and I think there's different pockets in Riverside depending upon who you talk to and how they believe what they believe about it. But you mentioned that um, you made a good point that the majority of the budget goes to people's 
salaries and benefits. So a typical district is 80% of the budget goes to paying people salaries and benefits. And for ours, it's a little lower because we have the, the, the contract is busing, but the busing still, the contract still pays for the bus driver's salaries and benefits and such. Well, the tension point that I'm just trying to be straight up about is that you, you know, you have a desire by the community to bring in quality teachers, quality administrators, quality staff in front of the kids and, and keep them there, right? Recruiting the same high quality staff. And then at the same time, you also have that belief that, that you don't want to overpay people, you don't want to pay them too much. You, you know, there, even when we ran our levy, you know, there were some that were concerned that that money was going to go to raises, things like that. So we just have to educate people that it's a kind of a balance when you do a budget. You you don't want to go crazy to where you're 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 overspending and you're going to go bankrupt and you're going to get in trouble. But you also have to. I mean, I can tell you when you when she says the word negotiation, our unions and our and our people have been really really reasonable to work with. But at the same time, you know, if you're you know, you can't. It's hard to not have money be part of the factor of being competitive comes to hiring teachers, hiring administrators, hiring staff. So again, it's just, I, I don't have a, a clear answer for you other than it's a little bit difficult to sometimes in a community like ours figure out that right balance. And we, we try to be competitive with the Northeast there. So when we talk about Deer Park and Paulville and Freeman and Nine Mile, those are usually the comparable districts that we look at when it comes to things like teacher salaries, Administrative salaries. We are not. It's, we're not comparing to CD. We're not comparing to Mead. We're not comparing to Spokane. But we do have to stay competitive with those other smaller, smaller districts. And uh, so I, I just I know you would know this. I'm preaching to the choir on this particular group. But it might if you ever get much. It's just it's just a sometimes challenging to figure out a balance. And it is an interesting uh, calculation to run for a lot of school districts. I've worked for several school districts in the area, and we run, I think ours is about 78 or 79 percent right now because of, of our expenditures go to staff because our transportation is paid, paid through the other means. So, you know, we see, which is a great uh, calculation. It's a very good calculation. I appreciate it. I've seen other districts be upwards of 86, 87 percent, and that's where you're going to run into that are, um, you know, everyone thinks you just given the money away. And I think the one thing about this, um, the, the biggest plus about this district is that we've really done a great job. You guys have done a great job managing the finances of the district. Um, and that's why we feel that we can drop funds out of the budget. Thanks, Okay, so where did we start? So, calling to order a regular board meeting, July 25th, 2024, uh, district office boardroom at 5.50. We'll start with our flag salute. Jocelyn, would you lead us? Marks for the good of the school. Well, I'll start off with uh, you know, just uh, after saying hello, everybody. Welcome. Good to see you all. Hope you're having a good summer. Um, I did want to let you know of a late, a late development. It's uh, I'm still kind of wrestling with it. But Peter Finn, who is our board member, who's not in, in attendance today, he called me about an hour and a half ago and let me know that he that he moved. And so he was living with his in-laws. Um, they were having some struggles with the property, the septic, and so on. So for that reason, they needed to move out of the district into the new district. And so when the rule of thumb, the law is when you move out of the district as a board member, uh, you have to resign your position as a board member uh, contingent upon the date that you 
move in either of these residents. Now, if you move within the district, like you know how we divide into five zones, basically, if you move from zone five to zone one, it's a different rule in that you can stay on the board until you finish your term. And his term uh, expires December of 2025. Well, because he's moving into these, um, he is, he did decide to resign his position. So he actually sent his letter to me like an hour ago. And so I just wanted you to be aware. I know it's a uh, lot to take in, but, um, uh, and then I do, I, one good news is that he's going to choose his kids into Riverside. I mean, because I, not that we don't care about him and his wife, but, you know, he does have two cool kids. Uh, so they're going to, they're going to choice their kids into Chatterwright Elementary. That's good. Um, the other thing I wanted to let everybody know, because I just called you right before the board meeting, just so you weren't shocked when I, when I announced it. Uh, the, the way the process works is that you have to have a board resolution that opens up the position. So our next board meeting is in August. So then at that meeting, you would have to vote on opening up the position. And then you have to have a very open and transparent process where you post it on your website, you advertise it in the paper, People, we typically, historically, have opened it for about a month and then tried to advertise it so people know. And then people uh, within that district, District 5, can then apply. So they submit a letter of interest, they submit a resume, and then the board itself reviews the application materials, decides who qualifies for an interview in a public setting. So if you look at the timeline of August, posting it for a month, it's not going to be until probably beginning of October where there would be interviews for the position. And then you would see who applies and who qualifies. And then the board would make the decision, much like a job, so to speak, even though it's a volunteer role, and uh, make that decision. And then that person, hopefully we get into it from people applying, that that person would then finish the term from <coughs> approximately October of 2024 through December of 2025. That then that 2020, that would mark uh, an election in November of 2025 for the next opening of that. So, any, any that was mainly just to give you all a heads up, giving the audience a heads up on that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Other remarks for the good of the school. Good evening, board, board of directors and Ken. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I am here to uh, congratulate Lisa for her, uh, maybe she didn't know that. Maybe she thought I was just here to watch her budget, but um, uh, Lisa Bjorklund served on our board of directors. So I'm from uh, the Washington Association of School Business Officials, also known as WASBO. Uh, Lisa came onto our board in 2020 after serving in lots of different capacities. I think she got roped into doing a lot of things early on because Lisa is one of those kind of people that just lights up a room. She connects with everybody. Um, she's always willing to jump in and try things. So she started um, as our ASB uh, uh, networking chair. So ASB is the associated student body. So that all the clubs and activities the kids are doing. Uh, so she said, yeah, what the heck? I don't know much about it. I just started in school, but yeah, I'll do it. And so she's always just had that personality and the willingness to do that. And so through that process, she has just met so many people and impacted so many lives throughout the state. Um, we have almost 2,000 members. Uh, so that's a lot of people. Uh, when I started at WASBO, I came from schools too. I was in schools for about 10 years. I started in 2017. We had 850 members, and now we have almost 2,000. So Lisa was part of that, really getting our WASBO community connected. Um, we serve uh, business directors, uh, business managers, payroll departments, accounts payable, uh, maintenance and operations, transportation, child nutrition, all the support and business office folks. Um, so we've really built a community, and Lisa's been part of that. She came on our, our board of directors in 2020. Um, <laughs> so if we all remember back to 2020, that was COVID, right? So that's when she was sworn in, and we were kind of all in this um, weird area. We had our first uh, our conference online. Um, we, we have a 
our conference every year in May, we were one of the only states in the country to do it online because I was just like, oh, we're going to give it a shot. Let's just see what happens. People need our help. And so Lisa was part of that coming on. So it was all of us just really kind of coming together. So she's been part of that. Um, she's served on our investment advisory group for WASBO. She's helped on scholarships and new curriculum. We've built a lot of online, on-demand training certification programs. Uh, so Lisa has served on a lot of that. And so we just really appreciate her service uh, to WASBO. And I just wanted to come here. She just recently finished her service to the WASBO board. Um, she was our, she served three years as president. So she came in as uh, incoming president and then outgoing president. So in May, we recognized her at our annual conference, which was in Tacoma this year. Uh, so in front of 750 people, we, um, we played a video um, from Claire over at Nine Mile, just appreciating Lisa of what she's done in this region uh, and then also in the state. So uh, I just wanted to come and thank Lisa for her service. Thank you, even though she's only been here a year, um, you're allowing her to do that. She just recently uh, presented with me at the Superintendent and Principals Association uh, conference uh, in Spokane uh, at the end of June. So we did a, a presentation on succession planning for your business office. So Lisa's always been um, great to help out and just really helping build our new leaders that are coming into school business and operations. So with that, I'd just like to give Lisa her award and um, thank her for her service and thank you for allowing her to give back to the community. So. Yeah, so we, we normally don't try to amend the agenda, but what happened was uh, we, we were doing negotiations with the public school employees, which is PSE, which is the classified employee union. And so we had an open contract, uh, and uh, uh, normally you try to get that done, and then they ratify it with their members, and then it goes to the board for final review. Well, the agenda had already gone out, and I was and not, not trying to take an excuse, but sometimes it's hard to get a date in the summer that everybody gets together in both negotiations teams. And so anyways, we finished yesterday afternoon, and so we did what's called a tentative agreement. And the tentative agreement means that we agreed on both sides of both negotiations teams, and now it goes to you for your review. So it wasn't in the board packet. I sent it to you yesterday. I asked you to do a, you know, a, a more expedited process of reading the contract. And so it's not the best, it's not the perfect way to do it, but at the same time, the other option is you wait until the end of August, and that causes trouble with budgeting. If you approve the contract, we are allowed to actually put all the numbers in the budget that Lisa has formulated. And so that's why we're asking you to amend the agenda to include the PSE uh, contract as a business item C, and then delete the executive session because the executive session originally was going to be about negotiations if we had not settled. Understand? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Thank you for your very much for your help. So I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Sure. Moving on to our superintendent, or excuse me, we've got uh, approval of minutes from previous meetings. Need a motion? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Superintendent report. Oh, I did. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Consent agenda. Need a motion. Second. Discussion? In favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. 
No, super simple. Uh, just, just three main topics. One is uh, every every year we develop joint board superintendent goals, and so I emailed you that a few days ago for your review of the draft goals. So check the email, and we don't have to decide on those today. But in my contract, uh, it states that we will develop those goals by August 15th. And so what's great about the joint goals that we've developed in the past is that it, uh, co it provides a cohesive approach between us. It's, it prioritizes our, our strategic plan and helps us prioritize our daily, weekly, monthly work with staff and the community and kids. So uh, one of the things you've noticed with our board, draft board of superintendent goals for your consideration is that uh, I noticed that last year we're almost too many. And so when you have so many goals, you can't even keep track of them, you, you forget to monitor them. So you'll notice that this year that I'm recommending for your consideration is one per day. And in, in today's world with all the information we have, I think one day is kind of nice. Uh, but it's our four strategic plan goals, whole child, culture and climate, community, and resources. And uh, so many of it is, uh, we've talked about since we've worked together, that you, you don't, um, you, you can't be everything to everyone. But instead, like any good organization, you, you narrow down some priorities and goals. And you try to get really good at those two things. That's why we only have four strategic goals. And so because we have a strategic plan, it's obviously at the top of the organization, we need to model that. So a lot of it is monitoring those things. So you monitoring me, uh, me monitoring the staff, principles working together. Uh, one thing I, I take great pride in, and I know you do as well, is, is that we, we need to communicate with our administrators and our principals. So our directors come in and board together meeting at least twice a year. Uh, there are some districts where I've worked with principals, they don't even want to do it. So we have the luxury of size and the ability of, of uh, smaller groups of people to come together. So anyway, it's not to bore you too much, but uh, it's really to introduce you to it. The other, the other document that I think is real, and I have other copies of these if people want to take them for um, the, the other, the other document that I think is really important, I think you passed it out, Matt, is some draft uh, student goals. So in, it's best practice that the board and the superintendent outline very clear measurable goals for student outcomes, and then share that and communicate that with principals and directors that then align the system all the way from the, the school board to the classroom. So you have the strategic plan of the district, then you have school improvement plans that then nest themselves under the strategic plan of the district. Then you have small group goals, which are grade level goals, subject level goals from students and teachers that nest under the school improvement plan goals, which then nest under the district goals. And then finally, you have individual growth goals for teachers and administrators that nest within the team goals and the school goals and the district goals. So these just, they're not set in stone, but it, I really wanted to highlight a few things. One is that when we started, when I first got here, our graduation rate was 76%. And now it's 92%. So we want to continue to build that up. So our goal is to go from 92% to 95%. Our kindergarten readiness goals were at 24% in 2016. They then went up to 73%. They dipped to 57%. We need to get them back up to 75%. So it, 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 you, you kind of, when we talk whole child, we, we do include test scores, and that's, that's an important thing to consider. But we have to look at holistic measures. So things like um, the graduation rate, Things like attendance. Uh, we have dual credit. Remember how we only have 15% of our kids getting dual credit, which is college credit and high school credit at the same time. And it's not limited to four year university, it's a four year university as well as two year, one year technical programs, trade schools. And so we're really proud of the fact that we are at, we're at 65%. This last most updated is 58%. But we want to keep moving forward and get that up to 70%. Um, one thing I'm really proud 
to share is that we were number one in the region for FAFSA completions. There were three applications for federal student aid given the cost of college and post-secondary education. We worked really, really hard. Our counselors did a great job. Our principals did a great job. But I really do believe that the role you play and the role I play is that we, we state the goals, we monitor the goals. We're not really heavy-handed. We try not to be, um, we try to be side by side with people as they're developing it. But I, I, I know districts, some don't have strategic plans, some don't have measurable goals. And there's a lot of research that shows when the board has it and the superintendent has it, it's actually more likely to happen. So I think the FAFSA is an example. And the counselors actually told me that. They said that motivated us to really get after it with counseling with our kids and checking in with our kids. So 57% of our graduating class last year completed the FAFSA. That was like a bump up from 30 percent the previous year. So in, anyways, uh, these, if you're cool with at least reviewing these and studying these, at some point in the August meeting, I'd really like us to formalize it. We can uh, uh, have talks about it one-on-one. -on -one. We can do two-on-one -on -one talks legally. We can also um, talk about it openly in public sessions. And so anyways, the boards have goals. These are the goals I'm recommending for your review. They can be tweaked. They can be like, like the budget, it's not it's a plan, it's, it's malleable. But I like that we have goals for our district plan. Questions? I know you're still stewing on it. I know you're. Oh, and lastly, is you base my evaluation on that too. So we can talk when you talk about my evaluation. I said, you know, I need to be humble enough to say I'm weak in this area or I'm strong in this area. I can work with principals on some goals too. Like, how are you influencing that improvement? And they can do that with their teachers and their staff. So it's really, really a, I, I think it's a smart way to look at this. So that's how I see it. Any clarifying questions? You know that's coming in, in August. Okay, the last thing I have is uh, we, we're going to be in a, at an important stage, right, where we're re engaging our community and our staff and our students and our families about our facility, long range facility plan. So that's one of the goals in our plan is for the board to have a long-range facility plan. And uh, and you've already decided that you're not going to rerun anything in August and you're not going to rerun anything in November. Uh, so then what that allows us to do is re-engage. So we can go out and uh, we've already recommissioned the facilities advisory committee. But what you need to give me guidance on is do you want to keep the same facilities advisory committee? Do you want to revamp that committee? Do you want to add more people to that committee? Do you want to get some new voices on that committee? Um, you know, I have some ideas on how we engage the community. Uh, we've done some 